You know, if you see a red, if you say, keep your eye open for red, a red car. We used to play this trick with the kids. Count how many red cars or how many white cars. And so the one that got the most cars won the competition for traveling. So during a long trip somewhere, so we had to help the kids fill in some time and play games. And you know what? If you look for red cars, guess what you see? If you look for white cars, guess what you see? It's, it's just, it's like that, isn't it? You, they just pop up everywhere. If you're driving a type of car that you think you're the only one with that type of car, guess what you start seeing? Oh, wow, there's one like, oh, there's another. No. And Jesus said, the harvest of souls is white. People are ready to give their lives to me all across the earth. And he, but he said to his disciples, lift your eyes and you will see that people are ready for me. Is it just me, or is have I just lifted my... Is it the glory of God descending on this in our area? Or is it just that I've lifted my eyes, that I begin to see people everywhere this week and last week, I see people ready to give their lives to Jesus. Is it just me, or is it you as well? Are you seeing this? Is it because we've lifted our eyes, or is it because God's beginning to descend with His glory over our city? Either way, it's good. Amen? It's exciting, isn't it? Oh, it's exciting. So uh, I've got an exciting message to share this morning. And, uh, well, I think it's exciting. I'll get excited anyway. (laughs) I feel it. So I'm going to do a summary of what we spoke of last Sunday. So if you could put the first PowerPoint up, please, uh, that'll be great. So I'm talking about portals, that portals are are like an open heaven where God seems to, in times past, he would visit his people. And uh, and so it's like Jacob saw this portal, this angels coming and going. And so we're not getting all hung up on on portals, we get hung up on Jesus. Yeah? The door is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. It's through Jesus that the presence of God comes. But before Christ came, there were these... uh, Heavenly doors would open up, portals. So Jacob is probably one of the most famous ones where we saw the portal open up over him. This is last Sunday I talked about this. The next one, please. But we see that under the New Testament, you don't have to be a special prophet or, 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 or priest or king because the portals would open over, up over only special people back in those days. But today, for every believer, for everyone who's been washed by the blood of Jesus, we have an open heaven over us 24-7 through Jesus Christ. Amen? So you have an open portal over you that only prophets, priests, and kings had. We have it now, 24-7. And that's so wonderful through, through Jesus. Amen. Next one, please. And so wherever Jesus went, he had an open heaven over his life. And his open heaven, when he'd come across somebody who is afflicted with a demon or sickness, Heaven's portal over Jesus would shut down hell's portal. Hell, the devil comes to rob, kill, and destroy. So wherever Jesus would come across humans who are under a portal of hell, his, the heavenly presence would just shut down hell, and their diseases would go, and their sicknesses would go. That's wonderful. And that's, that's the ministry of Jesus. That's your ministry too, the ministry of the believer. Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them who, in my name you will cast out devils. In my name you will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So this is our ministry as well. Next one, please. And so we talked about attitudes affect atmospheres. And we saw the attitude of the Nazareth uh, Fano, how they they didn't respect Jesus or they didn't have any uh, honor to his words or to who he was as the son of God. And their attitude shut down the heaven, open heaven closed up over them. There's no great miracles done. But Jesus goes up the road to the centurion, and the centurion said, I'm not worthy to be under the same roof as this man. So his attitude was of honor, and God opened up the heavens. His servant got healed, and many miracles took place in Capernaum. Next one, please. We saw also the attitudes of Uzo, the pre, uh, Uzu who tried to touch the ark, on the, on the cart is David, and the, uh, we're bringing back the Ark of the Covenant of God's presence to Jerusalem. And uh, Uzzah was killed, and David was ha and everybody was scared of the presence of God. But the same presence of God was left in a house of a man called Obed-Edom. And that same presence that brought judgment on Uzzah 
brought blessing upon Obed. And we read how attitudes affect atmospheres. Uzu's attitude was an attitude of dishonor to the presence of God, whereas Obed's attitude was an attitude of honor to the presence of God. So this week, hopefully, I'm experiencing attitudes affect at, uh, atmospheres. Um, we've had a busy week, a very disruptive week. We're getting things done on our house. And um, I, was, I had to guard my attitude <laughs> because... Uh, it was just so much disruption. We're busy enough without having to do things that you know had workmen at our house and so forth. And and I had to make sure my my attitude reflected the atmosphere. If I get all ho ha, then the atmosphere is not going to be very good, right? So even Pastor Norm has to follow this principle. My attitude affects my atmosphere, and I can keep thankful and praising God, or I can get oh man, this is ho ha, and have a negative atmosphere. And so by the grace of God, He helped me through. And yes, we got through there. In fact, as a result of keeping an attitude open and to God and just giving him praise, one of the workmen uh, began to tell me his life story. And um, long story short, he wants counseling, and I'm going to be able to share Jesus with him and so forth. So he's real, really open to Jesus. And I, if I didn't have that attitude, if I just, oh, just get the work done, kind of, but just taking time to invest in people and to give praise to God. Attitudes affect atmospheres. So anyway, there we go. Next one, please. And so we showed that on the day of Pentecost that the glory of the Lord filled the church. It came out of a temple, Solomon's temple, and it came and it was transferred into believers, into you and I. Next one, please, finally. Thank you. So the glory of the Lord dwelt behind a curtain, called, and the, behind the curtain is called the Holy of Holies. Next one, please. But when Jesus died on the cross, this beautiful thing happened. That curtain got torn. The glory of God that was once hidden but to all human beings, that curtain got torn by the blood of Jesus. And now Jesus reaches down through the curtain of his flesh. He says, I reach down to you. You can connect with my presence, my glory, anytime, anyplace, anywhere. All men. Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus. Next one, please. Okay, so the glory that used to be in the physical temple, tell the person next to you, it now dwells in your temple. Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus. Okay, next one, please. Next one, please. Um, okay. Is there one before that? Yeah. So this morning I want to talk about the difference between the anointing and the glory. The anointing of God's Holy Spirit, which is the most powerful thing there is. Beautiful Holy Spirit. Where, where would we be without Him? In trouble. But, and I want to talk about the glory of God. The glory of God. There's a difference. So... Uh, there you'll see a picture of me. I was ministering under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to a woman that was carried into a meeting on a stretcher. She could not walk for 12 months. And, uh, and as I ministered to her, she came up on the stage and she's running and dancing. I was involved in that. Jesus did it, but I was the vessel through which he used. But in the Old Testament, when God's glory would come, he would bring his presence across all the people without anyone even preaching. It wasn't Moses under the anointing. It wasn't an act of faith. It was just the glory of God's presence. And everybody just go, Fah. <laughs> you didn't need to tell people about God. I mean, he's right there. It's a Fah. Just like when we're worshiping. You don't need to tell anyone. You feel that? You say, oh. <laughs> That's the glory of his presence, the glory of God. And when God moves, you don't have to do anything. You just stand by and you watch God move. God can bring the dead back to life. God brings life. There was death. And I've seen God. We have seen. Some, many of us have seen God's moving. So I want to talk about the difference between the anointing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. As I'm speaking, some of you will feel the glory come down upon you. You'll feel the presence of God. He's real. I mean, he's real. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next one, please. So there are three ways that God can move on humans. He can move by faith. When we step out by faith, remember when you gave your life to Jesus, you may not have known much about what you were doing, but you took a step of faith, and God honored that faith. He honored that step of obedience. So we can move by faith, and God moves among us. That's one way. We can move under the anointing. And now when the anointing's on you, it's something that flows through you. It's the Holy Spirit of God flows through us. And you can feel it. Jesus said, who touched me? I felt power leave me. And so that's the anointing. It flows through us. 
But there's another way God moves, and that's called His glory. When He comes into a room or a town or a, na- or a city, and He moves without preaching, without us doing anything, He moves. And, think, and it's like we just stand and watch. And I believe He wants to move like this, not just on our church, but on our city. I really believe He wants to move on Turanga Nui Akiwa and the whole of Titaira. I believe it. It's like a portal He wants to open. And He's already done it once. He did it in 1834 through to 1854 through a man called Tomata Kura. And through that one man God used to cause a portal of heaven to open that shut down the portal of hell of hundreds of years of bloodshed and war and cannibalism and utu and revenge killings was shut down within a four-year period. It's happened before, and I believe God wants to do it again. He wants to open up heaven over the East Coast in a way we've never, well, a way that we have never seen, but that he wants to do. So moving on. Next one, please. So the so anointing flows through us. Remember what Jesus said, Somebody touch me. For, would you read this with me? But Jesus said, Somebody touch me, for I perceive power go out from me. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and when we pray in Jesus' name, that whole same Spirit of God flows out of us. Remember, we are not the healer. The Spirit of God in us is the healer. We are the hose that carries the water that gives life to the seed. We are just the vessel. This man here who was in my first trip to India. He came up. Like that. Pretty you can have someone there taking a photo. How he looked before, he was like this. That's the after the cutting here. I felt power go into him. I put oil on his head and I felt it. And he just went like this and just straightened up. That's the moving and the anointing. Thank you, Jesus. Next one, please. And so this woman was brought to me at a meeting in Pakistan. And um, they laid it before me. When I went to pray for her, I didn't feel anything in particular, but I just stepped out by faith. And as I stepped out by faith, the anointing came on me, and I grabbed her hand, and I began to pull at her, and I felt power. I felt it coming from her, actually. I felt her strength, and she pulled herself up. She used my hand to, to just to balance her, but she pulled herself up. She felt in her body she was healed, and she was completely healed. Of the thousands of people, an incredible miracle. That's moving in the anointing. So there's moving by faith, there's moving in the anointing. Next one, please. But the glory, when God moves, it's like you stand by and you watch God. You watch God doing the miracles. We, one of the first miracles we saw in Gisborne, me and Jess prayed for a lady who had, uh, was diagnosed with, with HIV, AIDS, it was through a blood transfusion or a Anyway, it was in her blood, and she contacted it as well as hepatitis. So she came for prayer, so we started praying by faith. The anointing came upon her. But then we noticed that she doesn't even, she's oblivious to us even being there. She's just standing there, and something's happening with her. So me and Jess, we sat down on the couch, hey, babe? We just sat and watched. We just watched God on this woman, and she's going, oh, oh. For about 10 minutes, she's, she's bending over, oh, oh, and she's not in pain. There's something going on. God's doing something. We're not doing it. God's doing something. And when she came out of that, she says, I'm healed. I'm healed. I says, how do you know you're healed? She says, I feel it. I says, I think your lumps have disappeared from your face, and you look a bit shinier than before. She says, I know I'm healed, Pastor Norm. And she went and got checked out. It took her several months to get the, the scans redone and so forth. Completely healed. To this day, she walks around our streets. See, that was the glory. So that's God. That's glory. And I want to see, you know, we've got to move by faith, and we've got to use our anointing and, and do our part to, to release, the, preach the gospel and to heal the sick. But there's a, there's a place where God just moves by His glory. And it says to Habakkuk that as surely as the waters cover the sea, so shall the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the whole earth. He says also in the latter day my house shall be filled with, the glory will be greater in the latter day than the former. I believe God wants to release an open portal over our city of his glory. I really, that's what I believe. And I believe that he's the one, Jesus is the way, but our attitudes affect the atmosphere. And they're just... Yeah, so that's what I believe. I know. 
So the glory, what is the glory? The glory is an atmosphere. Let's read that. Now the glory of the Lord, let's read it together. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on their seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud, or the glory. So it's the Lord, but his glory is the atmosphere. It's the atmosphere. It's an environment. It's not the anointing. It's an atmosphere of his presence that is sovereign. It's beautiful. And, um, and so he called, and it looked like a cloud. So sometimes the, the glory, it, it, there's a Hebrew word for it, uh, Shekinah, which is something that can be seen, like a cloud or fire or, um, or mist. But it also can be felt, another word for glory is kabod, which is weight, which is that weighty sense of his presence, something you feel that in your body. Um, it's something you can smell even, the fragrance. So the glory manifests in different ways. God is everywhere, but he's not manifesting everywhere. But when God manifests his glory, whoa. And we have seen, we have a track record in this house of God turning up, the glory of God turning up in our meetings. And we have just had to stand by, remember, and just watch. Wow, look what the Lord is doing. Who's doing this? It started in Tehapara School, actually. And... Uh, Ears being healed. People just sitting in their seats saying that they're healed without us praying for them. Not by their faith, not by the anointing. Just the, the atmosphere was so full of the presence of God because of the love of the people to Jesus. Jesus, just the presence of God would just manifest the atmosphere and people would come in and get healed and delivered. And You know, remember those days in Taupera School Hall and then the uh, War, uh, War Memorial and... Um, Lawson Field Theatre, and then t uh, the Archery Club. And um, in a sense, we followed the glory cloud. You know, the Hebrews followed the cloud by day and the fire by night. In a sense, we're f we're, as God grew us as a church, we followed where he wanted us to go. He's brought us here. But if he's brought us here, then he wants to fill this place with his glory. He does, eh? He wants to fill you and me with it. Okay, so moving on, next one. Uh, next one, please. So this is, this is some of the effects of glory. This is not something I did under my anointing or by faith. But these are two farmers came to me. Their crops, they, they, were, in, they were come to a seminar, but they, they lived 15 hours away, and their crops uh, were stricken by a plague. And they, start, they were weeping. They said, we come here to serve God. And, and all our Hindu neighbors say that, you Christian, your crops are dead. And he says, why would God treat us like this? And I, I didn't know why either. I didn't know. I said, I don't think God did this to you, but let's pray. So we prayed and we broke curses over their land. And about two or three weeks later, the farmer sent these photos. Uh, Pastor Lance would be a better expert at this and authority on it than I, that these were dead maize crops. That Literally, the plants are dead. They're just brown. And after a few weeks, green leaf started coming out of dead brown leaf. And they had one of the greatest uh, harvests of maize. Both the farmers had a huge yield that year of harvest. That's not my might. That's not my power. That's the glory of God. And I've discovered that in the glory, things can't die in the glory. Moses was in the glory for 40 days and 40 nights. Came back. Then he went back up for another 40 days and 40 nights without water. Without food. You can't live without water and food for 40 days, let alone 80. And he couldn't die because he's in the glory. And when you're in the glory of God, nothing can die because it's God's presence. Elijah got taken up in a chariot in the glory. Do you know he's got the same body that he was born in, the same physical tinana that he had when he was born hundreds of years, hundreds of years ago? It's the same physical body he's got. Because he's in glory, he hasn't died yet. Elijah hasn't died. <laughs> and he came back hundreds of years later and she turned up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Jesus on the mountain, remember? Elijah, he hasn't died yet. Because in the glory, there's no death in the glory. It's life. There's no disease can live in the glory. It's a beautiful thing, the glory of God. And so when the glory comes, it brings life, supernatural. It's 
Not by might. You can't figure it out. I can't figure that out other than, Lord, that's your hand. That's your glory. And so God manifests his glory through miracles. The first miracle that Jesus did was at the wedding feast. Turn the water to wine. And it says that was the beginning of him showing his glory. So glory affects things. The glory of God brings life out of death. Next one, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was me when I had a six-pack. I don't know if I got a six-pack there. Anyway, okay. that was me in 1999. And I'd, my, I had put my back out. So on this picture, you should see um, I'm sort of angled like that. Like, and I walked like that. And I was in excruciating pain for weeks and weeks. And no matter how much prayer, how much anointing, how much, how much fasting, how much crying out to God, it just didn't get better. It got worse and worse and worse until I was overseas in Malaysia with our team doing ministry there. And then just one day, out of the blue, God just decided to heal me. <laughs> he just did. And it wasn't my faith, and it wasn't my, my faith was all gone. And it wasn't the anointing. God bless, not, not putting down the anointing, it's the Holy Spirit. Never ever lay him down. Precious, beautiful anointing of God. It was an atmosphere. It was, uh, I can only describe, it's like God's glory would come upon me every morning at a certain time of the morning, and I'd feel my back go snap. Every morning it went snap, snap. Over 12 mornings it snapped itself completely in alignment, and I was healed. That was, I believe, the glory of God came upon my back. And put me put me right. Otherwise, I'd be a cripple now with a Zimmer frame. I think I was in trouble. My doctor friend told me you would need corrective surgery if God hadn't healed you. But God healed me because He's a miracle working God. That's a miracle working. So I'm just showing you the difference between glory and anointing. Next one, please. Next one, please. That little boy. He's now twenty something. He's 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 our, our spirit, one of our sons in India. And this is when I first met him. He's 14. And there's a whole bunch of kids, probably about, I don't know, 20 kids, children. And they're in this room, in this service in India, our first trip to Pastor Solomon's church. And the presence of God came and they all fell over. And they were all weeping. It was just beautiful. And we, all we did was watch. And then they got up and they began to explain what they saw. This young boy, he said he saw Jesus walk through the wall. He said, he's, I've called you to serve me. And he says, follow me. And he fell down and he's, he's getting up explaining what happened to him. We had nothing to do with it. It was God, out of his glory, God's calling people. Out of his cloud, he's calling people. So when the glory comes, people just get saved. In the New Hebrides, which is over in Scotland... There was a great revival there in the, in the 40s and the 50s and early 60s. And there's a documented accounts where uh, God's glory, God's presence came across an island. And there were hundreds of people, 800 or so people, who were woken up at midnight by just God. And these hundreds of people made their way up to the church. And they were wailing when they walked in. And the preacher of the day said 80% of them had already repented before they did become a, no preaching. It was just the presence of God brought a conviction on them. And they were, and that was one of the greatest revivals that's been in modern history. That's glory. Am I wanting to see that? Are we wanting to see stuff like that happen here? We need it. As much as we move by faith and move by the anointing and by aroha to our community for 32 years, There's still so much pain and and and, and there's too much much pain in Marmai on our coast. This is our people. We need faith, we need anointing, but we need glory. We need God in a way that He showed up in 1834. So I say, come on, God, do it again. Do it again. Amen. Next one, please. So this was in this was about 10 a.m. at night, 10 or 11 a.m. at night, in the middle of nowhere in Pakistan, hours away from Lahore. And I could not believe this, these crowds of people. There are thousands of people there. And I said to the pastor, where have they come from? Because there's no towns, no cities. And they're just there, <laughs> villages. And they said, he said, oh, they work till about 9 at night. That's why 
they can only come to late night. And there were all these people, thousands of them there. And it was such an honor for me to be able to serve them, to serve Jesus and to minister to them. But I touched none of them. And yet there were hundreds and hundreds of miracles and testimonies of people who had encounters with God, with Jesus. Some of them see Jesus walk among them as a man in white robes. This has got nothing to do with me. That's the glory of God. That's His glory. Woo! Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. So you and me, just our, our, our relationship with God, our keeping our portals open to God through Jesus and just spending that time with God and honoring His presence and calling it down upon ourselves and our homes and our church and our city. It starts with us. It starts with our fari, our fari. Starts with our lives, eh? Starts with our church. Not just this church. And it's not because just it's but let's get it invite and be attractive to the glory. So he'll come to our city. Oh Jesus. Next one, please. Next one, please. Thank you. So this happened in the days of Tomata Akura, 1834 to uh, 1854. If you don't know about the history, uh, Monty Sut is a historian who taught me on this, and, and he said that. There was bloodshed and war and cannibalism and cycles, eight, uh, hundreds of years of bloodshed in, in Utu. And uh, Tomata Akura was kidnapped by Napui. Ten years later, William Williams brought him back to Waiapu. At that time, there's a big battle about to take place between Fano or Tapanui and Ngati Poro. So Williams went back to Kirikiri. When he came back four years later, no more war. No more kaitangata, no more utu. He said there was a church of between one and 2,000 Māori already worshipping God, serving God, living with peace with one another. Aroha ki te atua, aroha ki te tangata. They were being reconciled to God and they were reconciled to one another. Now that had to be the glory of God. And when William Williams arrived four years later, he stood there and said, surely this is the, he gave glory to God. This is the salvation and the glory of God because he had nothing to do with it. It was God. God can do that again for our coast, eh? So this is uh, artifacts in um, the church of Patikitiki of uh, Piripi Tomata Akura. <laughs> what did he have? He had the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that seed at the scent of water, it will grow again. So it's time to start sowing again and sharing Jesus with people because people's hearts, I believe, are opening up to hear that they need Jesus and they want Jesus. Next one, please. Is this helpful? So I'm giving some instructions. So Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, eh? Because wide is the gate and easy is the road that, that, that leads to. And um, we're on the narrow gate. Following Jesus is not easy. It's a narrow gate and it's hard at times. But it brings life. The easy road is to... So I talked last Sunday about being spiritually passive and spiritually aggressive. So I want to qualify and I want to lift any condemnation of anybody who thinks that to be spiritually aggressive, you need to be on the streets shouting Jesus, ay, 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 or in the hospitals healing all the cancers. Okay, That's a type of spiritual aggression, but spiritual aggression is an inward attitude more than just an outward expression. Okay, We're going to look at that in a, in a moment, but, um, but I just want to, uh, I want to show that DVD clip, please. Um, so which one? We're going to show the uh, Brownsville one. So Brownsville is in Pensacola, uh, in the United States. And in 1995, God visited that church with his glory. And um, there were over 100,000 people got saved through that six-year period. And over 4 million people went through that church from all around the world. And when you sat there, the glory of God, you felt, I, I, I went there, I visited, and I, I felt it. Oh, my goodness. And the preachers did their stuff, and they're moving in the anointing. But when God just turned up, it's like everything just went to change gears, man. Nobody's preaching. People running down the front to get saved. I saw people jumping over the seats to give their lives to Jesus. <sighs> Imagine that. Queues outside of the car park. Hundreds of people in the car park. Let the video clip speak for itself. Thanks. Inside of me was calling out to the deep of God. And I said, Lord, there's got to be more. 
in the darkness where everything is unknown. A comprehensive documentary on the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida. Since Father's Day, June 18th, 1995, over three and a half million have come from every state and many nations to experience this mighty move of God. You would find hundreds waiting in line early each morning, anxiously awaiting the 7 p.m. service. What time did you get here this morning? We got here at 3.15. A.m. in the morning? In the morning. What time is the service tonight? It'll be at 7 o'clock. P.M., you mean? In the evening? P.M., yep. Why? Why do you get here so early? For the glory of God. What time did you get here this morning? About 3.15. 3.15 in the morning? Yes. Wow. And how have you ever been here before? The last couple of days. Tell me what you think of the Browns Revival. It's awesome. And what did you come for? We came for the presence of God. It's just been awesome. I it was beyond what I had anticipated and he's just awesome here. His presence is just incredible. It comes in like the tide and you can feel it and he's just so real. We see hunger. We see uh, people that are sincerely hungry to uh, have a personal relationship with Jesus. And we see that on their countenance, and when they stand in line, uh, it's, it's a face of, uh, of, of longing to have a, a relationship and to know the power that there is in serving Jesus Christ. And to see them being prayed for and to see their lives changed directly in front of us, uh, that's an awesome experience. First time I ever saw a bus pull up to Brownsville, I cried. I, I broke down and cried because, you know, to know that people was coming to the church where I pastor uh, for, to experience what we were experiencing, that we was loving so much. And I, I could tell the trend. I could see which way things were going. <clears throat> and I saw a bus pull up full of people, and, I, and when they got off the bus, I saw their faces. I saw the anticipation. I saw the wild-eyed look of, we're here, you know. When I meet God, He's going to touch us. I, I, I couldn't help it. I, I squalled. Well, I remember the very first time somebody came from South Carolina, and we were like, you came from South Carolina? I mean, we were just blown away. You're kidding, you know? And then we would begin to see busloads come in and, and, and churches being transformed, and then it would begin to dawn on me, there is something historical here that's taking place. I can remember when we filled the church in 58 seconds. Well, about 2,500 people filled the church in only 58 seconds. So we had people all the way around the church coming in every door and all the shrubbery, everything was beat down and even started running over each other. And that was when I told the pastor we had to do something. He said, well, do what you have to do. And so we started bringing them out here then and lining them up. It would be around 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. I would pass by in front of the church on Savanti Street. And I can always remember passing by, and there'd be many mornings at 9 o'clock, and there'd be a, a thousand people standing outside in lines. And I can remember how terribly humbling it was. You know, you're looking at these people standing in line, you say, man, people are hungry for God. And the thing about it is that, you know, you see it, it just creates a hunger and a humbleness inside of you to want to live right yourself and be part of this thing because, you know, you think, man, we live right here, you know, and we need to just 
realize what we have here and what God's done, how precious it is, and to protect that and to be part of that because people are giving everything and traveling many distances and using their vacations to come be part of what God's doing. Thank you. That's what the glory looks like when it hits a church. It's happening all over the world. Somewhere in the world that's happening right now in some nation, over some area, some church. There's these portals of God's glory that came through hunger and just calling out on God out of hunger and love and worship for God. Now, is that what I want for this church? Yeah, but it's not just for our church. It's not just so we have a, to fill the seats in this church. It's not just to make our church famous. It's not about that. We're, we're just a hose. It's about all the thousands of our whanau out there that don't know Jesus. It's about... the. All the Turanga Nui Akiwa, to Tairafidis, all our whanau up the coast, the ones down to Wairua, Te Kaha. It's, it's about everyone on our east coast who needs Jesus. That's what it's about. It's not just about filling this church and blessing this church so we're blessed. It's about blessing our community, blessing our city, and bringing the eternal purposes of God, the predetermined salvations that God has ordained for our coast. There are people that, you know, He ordained you to be saved. He chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose that you were going to be saved. He chose you. You didn't choose him. And so he had a plan, a predetermined plan that you would get saved. And for some of you, he used me to be that vessel. For some, he used someone else to be that vessel. But there are thousands on our East Coast, thousands and thousands that he's chosen. And let this be a church, one of the churches in this community that is a vessel that reaches all those that he's chosen that don't yet know Jesus is alive and Jesus loves them. So it's not just to bless our church, to bless me, to bless the name of this house. It's to bless the name of Jesus, to honor the name of Jesus. That people are flocking to the name of Jesus over this house. There's a portal in Jesus' name open up. They're not flocking to house of breakthrough. They're not flocking to my ministry or your ministry. It's they're flocking to Jesus. And that's what they did in Pensacola. I know because I was there. I spent, who? Oh, I spent uh, three days. Uh, two or three days there, and I felt it. And I was in the car park with 800 people at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the service didn't start till 7 p.m. It was real. And I said, Lord, do it, do, it, do it for us. We need it. Okay, how are we doing? What's the time? How am I doing, babe? We're going over time? Nearly 12. Okay, next one, please. <sighs> Team Jesus. Team self. How to keep these portals of heaven open. Stay on Team Jesus. Let's read this scripture. Sin is crouching at your door. It's desire to have you, but you must rule over it. This is what God said to Cain. Sin is always there. Self is always there. You know, has anyone been on Team Jesus? Yay, yay, yay. And then something happened. Your wife or your husband said something or your kids did something or somebody said or did something. Next minute, you've jumped onto Team Self again. And you're all self-pity and oh, I'm so hurt. And, and You know what I mean? I've done it. We'll do it. You know, when we're on Team Self, we're pandering to our insecurities. We're pandering. It's like patting a rabid, a, a rabid dog, a, a mad dog. Oh, you poor thing. That thing will bite you. It's got rabies. You know, self when we get selfish, when we're, when we're pandering to self, we're, who are we blessing? God or Satan? Who wants to bless Satan? No, thank you. But every time we pander to team self, we're blessing Satan. Because that's just what he wants. He doesn't want you anywhere near Jesus. But when we go through our little rudder rudder, we say, Lord, I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to put my big boy's trousers on, my, my big girl's bloomers on, and I'm going to suck it up and give you glory, Jesus. I'm going to give you glory because I'm on team Jesus. I'll do this for your glory, Lord. Okay? When you do that, you're cursing Satan. You're cursing him. But when you, te when you pander to yourself, you're blessing Satan and you're robbing God of his glory. So that's what I think. I said, no, no, I don't want to bless that devil. He's, he's hurt me enough. Well, that's, you know, so just stay on Team Jesus. Next one, please. How do you stay on Team Jesus? Well, Team Jesus, we are floating, we're going against the current. To follow Jesus means to go against the current of selfishness, the current of sin, the current the whole world wants to walk, you to walk with. It's not easy, Fano. It's not easy. The fact that you're still there, God bless you. 
It takes courage to float against the current and to follow the ways of Jesus. Next one, please. This is Team South. It swims with the current. It's so much easier just to give up. It's so much easier to stay at home, don't come to church. It's so much easier not to pray or read the Bible. It's so much easier not to give in to thoughts of temptation. It's so much easier, and many walk that way. We're not on that current. We're not on that team. We're on Team Jesus. Next one, please. <clears throat> so to be on Team Jesus, you've got to be spiritually aggressive. Okay? <laughs> So spiritual aggression is not, ah, in the name of Jesus, uh, on the street corner preaching. It's not just going through ch uh, hospitals and healing the sick. It, that's a spiritual aggression. But it's not necessarily spiritual aggression, because I've seen people do that out of the flesh too. <laughs> it, spiritual aggression is this, reading your Bible every day. That's spiritual aggression. When you don't feel like reading your Bible, praying. Every day, when you don't feel like praying, you're going against the current. That takes aggression. Coming to church on Sunday when it's raining. You're exercising spiritual aggression. You're going against the current. That's spiritual aggression. That's spiritual aggression. There can be people on the streets shouting the name of Jesus, but within about you know, a couple of years, next minute, they're gone. Where are they gone? But you're still here. Faithful Church going, tithing, loving Jesus, still here, still being used to bless our community because you're spiritually aggressive. So when I said, come on, guys, be more aggressive spiritually, that's what I meant. I didn't mean you have to be outward signs of, 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 uh, of religious fervor, but you are spiritually aggressive when you go against the current. Just this stuff, just driving the car, and I was just saying, oh, Jesus, you're awesome. I was just praising him yesterday. He said, that's spiritual aggression, son. You're going against the current. Most people are not driving around their cars giving me praise out of the blue. Do you do that? You're a spiritually aggressive. And it's not all the time that I do it, but, you know. And so, you know, giving your tithes and offerings to bless our community, that's spiritual aggression. That's going against the current. So I just wanted to qualify. Be, don't be spiritually passive. Be aggressive. Since the days of the kingdom of, uh, since the days of John the Baptist, Jesus says the kingdom of God has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Spiritual aggression. Next one, please. So, closing on this, the attitude affects atmospheres. Paul and Silas, there they were in prison, beaten up, bleeding, wounded, maybe dying, not sure whether they're going to be executed the next day. They're in a whole lot of pain. Atmospheres affect. Uh, attitudes affect atmospheres. So in the pain, they lifted praise. That's a catchphrase. In the pain, lift your praise. You can write that down. In your pain, learn to lift your praise. And in their pain, they lifted their praise. You know what God it said? God heard. God sent an earthquake. How do you know it was from God? Because God sent the earthquake and it, it, their chains fell off. Their prison doors opened. God sent an earthquake. That's glory. That's glory, man. That's glory. Hell's portal got shut because God opened up his portal because of their praises and the pain. Woo! -hoo! In your pain, on Team Jesus, it's hard sometimes to keep giving him praise because the devil wants you to pat him. The devil wants you to pat yourself. Get on Team Self. He wants you to bless him. But don't bless him. Give glory to Jesus. And in your pain, I still love you, Jesus. And that. You're opening the heaven's portal, shuts down hell. And heaven's portal shut down hell's portal over these two men. I want to pray for people uh, now um, because I saw, that, uh, I saw that Jesus wants to set you free from a lie. And the lie is it says that you have fear. Or the lie is that it says you are sick and you're not sick, you're healed. And you carry this sickness in your in maui, it's in your puku, it's in your stomach, and it's like a, it's a turning thing. And uh, I'm, so I can pray for anybody, but the particular, it's in your stomach. I saw it in your stomach. And truth is going to deliver you from the lie. The truth says, by my wounds you are healed. You do not have a spirit of fear. You have a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. You do. See, there's a portal here because of the faith and the anointing of God's presence. But God's glory also is here as well. So... So, um, oh, I thought it was an angel, Tom. <laughs> so we're going to um, just close with that now. 
And uh, I hope that's helped you, Whānau. This is part two of uh, Glory Portals. So it's just instruction. So stay spiritually, spiritually aggressive. When you feel like giving up, you, don't, you just keep pushing into Jesus. Praise God. Spiritually passive is you just go with the flow. You go get with the current. But you're not passive. You're aggressive. You are. You're not going to be. You are. This is the truth. You are. And some of you just, you just want to encourage you, just believe who you are. Believe the truth. You do not have a spirit of fear. You have a spirit of power, love, and a sound. You are not fearful. That's what I saw in the stomach. Fear. I saw anxiety, and it's making you sick. If that's you, come on down here quickly, 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 quickly. If you're carrying something in your stomach, there's a sickness in your stomach, there's a fear that's been uh, following you, just come down, come down, quickly, quickly, quickly. You're not afraid. You're not afraid. It's a lie. You're not afraid. You're strong, and you're full of courage. You're not afraid, neither does it. That's the truth. The devil's a barefaced liar. He said to Adam, you won't die. Jesus, God says, you will die. The devil says, you won't die. He's a liar. The devil says, you've got this, you've got that. You don't have it. The truth sets you free. Jesus took it. What the law could not do, he has done for you. By sending his own son in the likeness of your sinful flesh. And he condemned your sin in his flesh. And thus, by his wounds, you have been healed. Will you put your hand on your tummies, please? <clears throat> I rebuke you, filthy spirit. <clears throat> 